medical issue, and so she's helped me a lot. So thank you very much, Mr. Vice Chair. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to run through these resolutions on the. All of them are on the consent calendar, all the resolutions. If anybody wants anything pulled, please raise your hand and let me know. I don't see anything, so let me start reading through these and we'll try to get through these and then we can get to the uh, everything on second. RS 2022-1807, Roten, Syracuse, Welsh and others approves the detection and mitigation of COVID-19 and confinement facilities grant from the Tennessee Department of Health to the Davidson County Sheriff's Office to enhance and improve the practices of confinement facilities to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 and reduce the risk of virus transmission and exposure to environmental health concerns. RS 2022-1808 wrote and approves the Metropolitan Law to settle Seth Taylor's claim against Sergeant James LeMaster of the Davidson County Sheriff's Office in the amount of $50,000 be paid out of the Employee Professional Liability Fund. RS 2022-1809 Hauser wrote and Welsh and Suara approves a donation from the local Nashville Hayes LLC to the Housing Trust Fund Commission to bring more affordable housing to Nashville. RS 2022-1810 wrote and Parker approves an intergovernmental license agreement between the Tennessee Department of Transportation and Metro Government to the sharing of fiber optic cable assets for network communications. RS 2022-1811 wrote in Syracuse, Wells Suara approves, approves the Health Safety Start Initiative eliminating racial ethnic disparities grant and approves Amendment 1 to the grant from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to the Metropolitan Board of Health to provide a variety of services and reducing infant mortality for pregnant and parenting women. RS 2022-1812 wrote in Welsh, Hauser and Suara approves the Continuum of Care Program Grant Agreement between the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and the Metro Social Services Department to continue to contribute to contribute to the national effort to end homelessness. RS 2022 1813 Roten Welsh Hauser and Sora approves the continuum of care grant agreement between the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and Metro Government to fund support services and administrative costs in contributing to the national effort to end homelessness. Number eight, RS 22-1814 wrote in Syracuse, approves a grant from the Tennessee Department of Safety and Homeland Security to the Metro National Police Department to continue the enhanced DUI enforcement initiative and target distracted driving and seatbelt enforcement. RS 2022-1815 wrote in Syracuse, Welsh, approves an anti-terrorism and emergency assistance program grant from the Tennessee Department of Finance and Administration to the Metro Office of Emergency Management to support victims of mass violence and terrorism. RS 2022-1816, Roten Withers, Pulley, O'Connell, approves a proposal between the Tennessee Department of Transportation and Metropolitan National Department of Transportation for the acceptance of a construction easement and the maintenance of traffic control devices in connection with construction of a bridge replacement on State Route 1 over 11th Avenue South and CSX Railroad. RS 2022-1817 wrote in Pulley Withers approves the Safer Street Nashville Pedestrian and Bicycle Safety Awareness Grant from the Tennessee Highway Safety Office to the Metropolitan National Department of Transportation and Multimodal Infrastructure to educate the public on pedestrian and bicycle safety awareness. RS 2022-1818 wrote in Pulley Withers and Van Reese approves an application for a bridge investment program grant from the Tennessee Department of Transportation to the Metro Nashville Department of Transportation and Multimodal Infrastructure to replace two bridges over CSX active rail lines within their right of way in the Madison and East Nashville neighborhoods. RS 2022-1819 wrote in Pulley Welsh and Suara approves an application for the Safe Streets for All grant from the U.S. Department of Transportation to the Department at Metro National Department of Transportation and Multimodal Infrastructure construct safety improvements for those walking, bicycling, and using transit along Nolensville Pike between McCall Street and Haywood Lane. And that is everything on consent. Hold on just one second. I'm just going to make sure. One, two, three, four. And just making sure we had a quorum here. Can I get a motion properly seconded? All in favor? Any opposed? You adopt all. How many, how many folks here? Mark off everybody I've seen. Sounds good. Gotcha.
going to bills on second reading this is bl 2022-1381 parker allen van reese and others amends chapter 55.04 of the metro code code requiring payments in lieu of taxes made by the convention center authority be dedicated to affordable housing initiatives can't read tonight and we have a substitute by uh council members allen and sledge and I see Colby's here and Berkeley's also here. Um, are y'all wanting to introduce the substitute? And I see heads nodding up and down. So uh, Councilmember Allen, Councilmember Sledge, who's gonna take this? Councilmember Allen, let me find you on the board here. And you're recognized. Um, thank you. This just uh, clarifies a couple of questions that came up when this came through the first time. One is there were some references to um, the definition of affordable housing that actually sort of inadvertently excluded the Barnes Fund, which is what the main point of this is. And then there was a question of, do we want this to be available for any other um, avail um, affordable housing um, initiatives? And if so, can we be very specific about what those are? So this this uh, specifically says that the fund, it defines what affordable housing is and, and allows it to include 80% AMI, which is what the Barnes Fund often also includes. And it specifically says that these funds could, under certain circumstances, be used for the housing incentive pilot program, uh, but set a limit on that amount so that uh, by far the bulk of this would go to the to the Barnes Fund, which was the goal that we wanted to do that. So that's what the substitute does. And if okay. Councilmember Sledge wants to add anything, I would welcome his comments. Councilmember Schley to recognize. Uh, no, I, d I actually just wanted to thank Director Hubbard. I know she had worked on trying to sort of, we had talked about, we wanted to kind of combine our visions, Councilmember Allen and I, and I think she, this, this does that. I do know that it's one of those things where it's not set in stone, but I do think it gives a good um, foundation or guidance to say, hey, this is, this is how we want to see this spent, and this is what we mean when we talk about affordable workforce. So uh, I hope uh, members support it. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Sledge. Anyone else? Oh, Council Member Vercher. I want to say welcome, Chair. This this is your first committee meeting. It's my second one, actually. Oh, I, made, I missed I the first I, one. I made my first one before. I made my first one before my back broke down. Okay, so, so I must have missed that one. Yeah, so. Okay. <laughs> so welcome, Chair. It's great. Great to have you back. Thank you, former member chair. I appreciate having, I have five former chairs of this committee, so I appreciate all y'all because I know I can go to y'all. So a wealth of knowledge. I didn't have that chair when I chaired, so yeah. a wealth of knowledge. You, all you had was me, and that's not good. Uh, I had right. you. you. You were you were great. You were great. Thank you. That's why you're in the big seat now. Um, so just if one of the sponsors can speak to just in practice, how, how will this work? Council Member Allen. <laughs> I think I may ultimately defer to the financial experts over there, but it, it officially says that we will take the money that the uh, convention center is paying in pilots and we'll dedicate it to a fund, mostly to the Barnes Fund and perhaps 500,000 of that also to the um, to the HIP. In, in terms of functionally how that actually goes or if there are other tricks that can happen, I would I would defer to the financial whizzes over there to- Anyone at the administration details. table wanna take this up? Uh, no, Chair, I believe the council member got it right. It um, does state that it will be designated into a, sp a specific fund for uh, funding, just as the council member pointed out. Council member Virtue, you have any more questions? Yeah, just trying to nail down how it's gonna work in practice um, so that we don't have um, uh, 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 minority entities that's in this space indicating that they don't have access uh, to the fund. Okay. Does anybody want to take that up or do y'all think it's been answered appropriately? Thank you for those questions. The um, the Barnes Fund would operate according to all of its traditional um, policies and procedures that the Trust Fund Commission establishes. This, this is just the um, additional funding mechanism that um, uh, gets it at that robust level that, that we've um, asked for through the task force. And as we've brought back, um, and Ashley's here to talk about um, ways that we've tried to enhance and encourage minority participation uh, 
um, there's a specific set aside now for small organizations um, doing further outreach to uh, minority owned um, businesses that are contractors or developers ways to partner with the red academy all of that would, would it's all of that would be rolled up with within this funding Councilmember Vercher. Thank you, Chair. She mentioned uh, the Red Academy. I need that stain. I'm on the advisory board. Okay. So you'll be marked as abstaining. Councilmember Hurt, did you need any? You recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I actually was going to ask the same questions, but just want to know is there any accountability to make sure that those. Um, rules and regulations that have been put in place because I know Councilmember Swore did pass resolution to ensure that there was some equity um, uh, attempts made in this. So just want to make sure that it is because we know that although we've given money to the Barnes funds, it has not been spent and used in the time frame in which we would hope it to be. And I know Ashley has just been doing an outstanding job and I really do appreciate it, but I just wanted to reiterate um, the, the idea of making sure that it is an all-inclusive uh, effort made. You're recognized. Thank you. I'm Ashley Brown. Um, uh, so on the part of Barnes, the sub or I'm sorry, the ordinance that Council Member Swara had introduced, it does have a sunset um, timeline in there, but there's still a two additional years on that um, requirement. However, the commission fully believes that um, that set aside is more than worthy of existing in perpetuity. Um, I can't speak for the commission and how they allocate funding from year to year. However, they have consistently dedicated at least 20% of the annual allocation for minority subcontractors. Um, the language specifically says um, for small nonprofit organizations because of Metro Code and Metro Law and how we have to go about that. However, that typically encapsulates a lot of um, smaller, nonprofit developers that are just starting out, like the folks coming out of the Red Academy and those types of situations. However, um, the Barnes Fund also um, does continuous outreach to other organizations and encourages them to apply and additional funding only allows us to continue that and further that education about how the Barnes Fund works and get more money out to uh, more developers that are maybe just starting out and getting their first projects off the ground so Barnes can be the first money in. Um, additionally, the um, overall process for Barnes, um, the actual set aside for those small organizations has existed since 2016. So we've only ever grown that set aside for small nonprofit organizations. And although we've had some discussion about how our budget from year to year looks like those monies are not being spent, we've spent over $40 million in reimbursements already for organizations that are putting units on the ground. The other money Money that's in our account is obligated and just subject to the construction timelines of the nonprofit developers out there putting those units to work. So um, although we are a passive funding mechanism, those monies existing in our account are already obligated and any new funding is for future units to build on to the already 4,000 almost, or 3,300 um, units that Barnes has put to work um, through the, the last uh, seven years of funding. So if I, there are any other questions, I'm happy to field that, but hopefully that answered some of the ones that you had. It did, thank you. Now you talked about reimbursement. Are all the funds reimbursable because those small nonprofits have uh, issues with being uh, having that upfront capital in order to do projects such as this? And that oftentimes is what uh, dismisses them from being eligible for uh, grants and, and opportunities like this. So is it any way that there can be some um, upfront capital extended to them or some line of credit or something that will allow them the opportunity to take advantage of such opportunities? Because when they don't have it and are unable to do it, then having the laws in place really don't mean anything because they still are not um, have the capital that they need in order to take advantage. 
thank you, Chair. Um, so with upfront capital, the policies and procedures of Barnes does require there to be a matching requirement for all of the dollars that Barnes put to use. We've only ever granted on a reimbursement basis and part of that is because we're stewarding taxpayer dollars. We want there to be accountability and so that gives us um, a way to send out a third party inspector, look at financial reports, make sure that those dollars are used in a fiscally responsible way. Um, not to say that any upfront dollars would not be used fiscally responsibly but um, the main advantage of having barns available to small nonprofit developers is that we can be first money in and so when they go back to their lenders and say we are we have a, a barns award coming in these are our matching dollars then um, the lenders are often more inclined to lend more to the developers which does give them more access to the capital which is why we typically talk about leverage and what they're able to leverage on top of just the barns award and their matching uh, equity that they're bringing to the table. Uh, the other uh, side of that, the only time that we do offer funds to um, developers as in land acquisition. So with land acquisition, if they have a signed sales contract, Barnes can come in and be the money to acquire land. And that is reimbursable, but that would still require them to apply with a, a signed sales contract or something to that effect that proves that they have um, a deal on the table already and Barnes can come in and be that money, that first money in. Um, other than that, we've always funded on a reimbursable basis and for that to change, it would require a substantial change in Barnes policies, which is up to the commission. Well, I, you know, I think that really goes against what the Barnes funds, I thought, was um, uh, designed to do, especially the part to help in these small uh, nonprofit organizations because uh, a nonprofit organization that I once led uh, did the same type of deal and uh, we were to be reimbursed and in the end they ran out of money, not Barnes Fund, but the other entity ran out of money and the organization was left with $15,000 that they had to, you know, eat. And, um, and it's already a, a disparity. So having these restrictions on these funds really is no different in what the lending institutions do because these nonprofits don't have the uh, paperwork. They don't have the finances because they're always operating in a catch-up manner because of it being reimbursable. So they don't really have the qualifications to truly compete. So I thought something like the bonds funds was going to make it a little bit easier. But if you're going to hold them with the same accountability as these lending institutions, then it's still not addressing the problem that we have. So I, I'm, I have an, an, an issue, honestly, um, with this because it's not actually offering anything uh, fair in regards to it. Thank you, Councilmember Hurt. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Swore. <laughs> Thank you, Chair, and I want to thank Councilmember Hood for her comments, and I think it's something that, um, as the council representative on the commission, uh, we can take back and take a look at and see what else we need to do. But I do want to add to what Ashley said. One of the things that that 20% is also doing is also capacity building, and that includes actually teaching and talking to these small organizations on how they can leverage that and providing the mentor mentorship. We had our strategic planning about a couple of months back, and there was a whole lot of discussion into now, how do we make sure that these small organizations are able to use that 20%? And so a lot of them don't know where to start. A lot of them don't know how to apply. There's still so many things that goes into it. And I think the balance fund is ready to, to do that. But in terms of, um, actually fronting the money, that never came up. It was never a discussion, but I think it's something that we'll take a look at and see what that means. But I do want to say that there was a serious conversation. Uh, this is the first year of that 20%, was to trying to, at least the official 20%, uh, trying to work out the details of it, and I think your comments will be appreciated by the commission. Thank you. Councilmember Hurt. Yeah, thank you. I, and this is this will be my last comment. Thank you, Councilmember Swara. I did actually go before the commission, and they did hear my.
my comments. Um, and they welcomed, did, and, and, and many of them reached out to me after to find out some of the things that could be done. But as we continue to put money towards the Barnes Fund and we don't make any changes, then we're going to continue doing what it is that we've always done. And that needs to change. Thank you, Councilmember Hurt. Uh, we have before us the substitute by Councilmember Allen. We have a motion properly seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? We're on the bill 2022-1381. All in favor? Any opposed? Oh, I'm sorry. My apologies. I didn't see Councilmember Mendez on the bill. Councilmember Mendez, you're recognized. Thanks. Um, we've, we've talked about this at previous meetings. Um, this doesn't serve to dedicate funds. I appreciate the work of the sponsors on the substitute, um, but I, I think this is mostly an act of performance art by the administration and, and not anything that really dedicates funds on a going forward basis. And for that reason, I'll vote against it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Mendez. We're on the bill. All in favor? Any opposed? We have two nays, 12 in favor, and, there, and there's an abstention. 11 in favor, two against, one abstention. On BL 2022-1410, O'Connell, Johnston, Young, and others, we have a letter from Councilmember O'Connell, lead sponsor, to defer indefinitely. I have a motion properly seconded. All in favor of motion to defer indefinitely. Any against? <laughs> 14 in favor, zero against to defer indefinitely. BL 2022-1450, Council Member Allen. Amends chapter 2.222 of the Metro Code relative to expense, reimbursement, and legal representation in ethics matters before the Board of Ethical Conduct. And we have two amendments, Amendment 1 by Allen, Amendment 2 by Council Member Mendez, and I am told that these do not jive. So hopefully someone can explain to me how they don't jive, and that would probably be legal counsel or one of our, one of our esteemed at-large council members. Council Member Allen, would you like to lead this off? I'll start and we can all join in. Um, my amendment does two things. One is I added some recitals so that I could explain the intent of this ordinance. Um, and then the second is to, to, uh, to clarify more specifically that the goal of this was to provide um, a layer of protection for appointed individuals on our boards. Um, and so I have added some, in, um, some language that just says because our boards are important and because we wanna be able to get good people and sometimes that is challenging and we want to be able to, to let them know that they can make difficult decisions without fear of retribution. Therefore, we are um, providing a mechanism where if the circumstance requires it, and they are taken uh, before the ethics board with something that is proven to be unfounded and that they required legal representation uh, to get to that point that they could request reimbursement up to a certain amount. Um, so the, what the amendment does is takes out any references to elected officials because the intention was not to apply any um, any, any reimbursement for elected officials. We, we at least have access to legal counsel who can tell us um, what the law says, they won't represent us, but they can at least tell us what the law allows. So again, the goal of this was to, um, to protect appointed board members uh, because I think we need really good people to serve on the boards and I want them to be able to, um, to be willing to serve on the boards and I want them to know that they can make uh, tough decisions without fearing re retribution. So that is, that is the goal of the bill originally and my amendment is simply to clarify that goal and to, to take out the, rep the references to elected officials. Um, and I guess we'll let someone else talk about maybe why the two don't jive, but I appreciate Council Member Mendez's um, concern about uh, citizens dealing with ethical um, issues. And that, that may be a, an issue that we wanna deal with, but that was not the intent of this bill. So I would, I would ask that we let this bill do what it's intended to, and if another one needs to be brought forth, then, then that would be um, the decision of Council Member Mendez. I, I was kind of thinking that I'd let Councilmember Mendez explain what he's trying to do, then let 
our esteemed council explain the differences and we could take, that way we can just take up a vote on yours and if you don't get them, then we can go to Councilmember Mendez's. Councilmember Mendez, you're recognized. Thanks, and so where I'm coming from on this is in my litigation practice, I think I've worked on, I don't know, a hundred disputes through my career that involve attorney's fees provisions, either set up by contract or um, statute or ordinance or federal law. And, um, and in a couple noticeable, uh, notable incidents, is um, laws have changed through the course of my career. So you can, you can see behavior um, on how lawsuits get filed after the state changed fee shifting on motions to dismiss in civil matters or when a new ordinance gets passed um, that has uh, attorney's fees shifting language in it. And, and it matters on real life behavior about how it works. And having been through that, there's um, even after the amendment, there's a couple of, I think, material problems with this. Number one, um, citizens rarely take advantage of the ethics complaint process as it is. I've, I've heard somebody who is a Metro insider decline to pursue an ethics claim that they thought was valid um, because they didn't want to deal with the technical legal process of witnesses and evidence. And, and I know certainly that uh, members of the public um, the, it, it is already challenging to get into um, filing one of these. Um, to my knowledge, in the seven years I've been in office, I don't know whether a Metro person has been found guilty of an ethics violation as it is. Maybe, I, I know some people have quit um, before they got to the hearing, um, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure I'm aware of the ethics board ever ruling um, in, against a Metro elected person. And we have to know that this will further chill the public um, from pursuing an ethics complaint. And the whole point of the thing is to have an outlet, an independent outlet for citizens who are aggrieved on an ethics thing to go complain about it. And they already don't take advantage of it very often and they never win. Um, and this is only gonna make it more difficult. The other thing that is, um, I think, uh, perhaps well-intentioned, I'm sure well-intentioned, um, but really not smart um, of the body is the, the legislation puts the council effectively being sort of a pseudo appellate body um, where if somebody um, defends themselves successfully in an ethics complaint, then they get to come to the council and we decide whether they're eligible to be reimbursed or not. So fundamentally, we're either gonna be having a blend of this is a political body, if our friends show up, we're gonna reimburse them, um, blended with, uh, well, was it a legitimate complaint that um, like they just couldn't quite prove it, so no reimbursement? Just the idea of injecting this body into the business of saying whether there's an ethics complaint worthy of reimbursing the Metro person um, it puts us in uh, a funny spot, if that's the case, where we're either gonna look like we're just um, reimbursing our friends because let's face it, most board and commission members are friends of the council. That's how they get to, they're, they're plugged in. They know that's how they get the gig in the first place. We're either gonna be viewed as just reimbursing our friends or we're gonna have a lot of maybe angst filled back and forth in the chamber about whether this was really a legitimate complaint even though the person didn't manage to win against the board and commission member. And between these things, the idea that we're gonna go out of our way to chill the public from making ethics complaints when they already are chilled and they already never ever win, um, coupled with injecting the council into being a sort of pseudo appellate body, um, I think based on at least my experience in dozens and dozens of, of dispute disputes with um, fee shifting provisions. I think that this um, is uh, well-intentioned, but not effective for the body or the city. Thank you, Council Member. Oh, I'm sorry, so my amendment, I kind of hate my amendment. I'd rather the bill just fail. Um, if the bill's gonna pass, I think we should at least make it so um, uh, complaining parties um, could get reimbursed too. And since we would be injecting ourselves as a pseudo appellate body, surely if there's some, uh, 
complain citizen out in the community that has a good complaint and they actually manage to win even though they never win and it's a great complaint surely the body should have the willingness to offer reimbursement to that person um, just as much as we're willing to um, reimburse a board and commissioner member so the point I'd rather see the whole thing fail but I think we should at least make it fair so prevailing party has a chance to, to ask the council to grant fees or not Thank you, Councilman Ramirez. If, uh, if it's okay with everybody, I'm gonna ask um, Director Darby to uh, explain the bill and then the difference between the two amendments so y'all can understand kind of in a concise fashion what you'll be voting on or not voting for. So um, you're recognized. Well, the original bill included uh, both elected officials and members of boards and commissions. Um, giving them the ability to request uh, payment up to $15,000 for uh, legal and other related expenses if the ethics board determined that there were no alleged ethics violations. Um, the Allen Amendment modifies that. It adds some explanatory recitals as well as um, removing the ability for an elected official to come and ask for the reimbursement. Um, and it limits it to members of a board or commission to ask for reimbursement for the cost of defending the complaint, including reasonable attorney's fees. Um, this is if the ethics board determines that there is no alleged ethics violation. Um, and it makes it very clear that this shall not be available for elected officials. Um, the amendment two offered by Councilman Mendez um, also removes elected officials and it states that at the conclusion of a board hearing, the council may award or provide the prevailing party uh, the reimbursement for the cost of defending the complaint, including a reasonable attorney's fees. This is a little bit different because it removes the language that says, if the board determines that there's no alleged ethics violation. Um, and it also makes it explicitly clear that this is not available for elected officials. In both cases, the amount of reimbursement is capped at $15,000. And in both cases, the council would have to be the entity that approves the reimbursement. Thank you, Director Darby. Do I have any questions? Council Member Suara, you're recognized. Thank you, Chair. Uh, as a non-legal person, just listening, so my understanding then is that if the idea of the bill is to stop frivolous um, complaints, this doesn't do that because then everybody gets reimbursed, whoever wins gets reimbursed with, with the Mendes Amendment, is that correct? So whether it's the citizen or whether it's the board member, anybody can just come and get a reimbursement. If they, if, if they win, or if they, is that what it, I'm trying to? Councilmember Mendez. At the discretion of the, so we'll, we'll, I mean, you can imagine we're gonna have some interesting floor debates about whether to reimburse anybody. Um, if that, but it, it will be, a, it's not automatic the way it's written. It's at the, it, the council may grant it. Um, so if somebody on whoever side prevails, then they get to come here and and if they, I guess, find a sponsor um, for legislation, they can ask, and then we'll have a conversation about whether to grant it or not grant it. So then it will still be at our discretion whether we say yes or no every time. Uh, okay, all right, thank you. I, I, I don't know how that works because I think it just defeats what the bill is trying to do. And I also still understand uh, at the same time what Council Member Mendes is trying to do to make sure that we're not discouraging people from filing complaints because then they have to bear the cost of filing that complaint. Whereas the elected person or, or board member get the opportunity to get reimbursed. So uh, at this point, I, yeah, thank you. Council Member Johnson, I saw your hand up. You still want to be recognized. Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, after hearing Councilman Mendez's response, I don't like 
that we are put into the middle of any of it, to be honest with you. I think if there's an ethical complaint, that's between the Board of Ethics and the complainant and who they're complaining against, and this body should not have anything to do with it, whether it's reimbursement, whatever, that, that causes a, I think, a multitude of issues. And so I'm gonna be voting against all the, I'm everything related to this, I'm voting against it. Council Member Evans, you're recognized. Um, thank you, Chair. And I may have missed it, but is there any information about how many ethics complaints have been received on a border commission member? There's only one that I can think of off the top of my head. Council, uh, Director Darby, do you know? Um, I don't I don't have that information, but it's something that I can ask for. Okay, thank you. Council Member Gamble. Thank you, Chair. Listening to both sides of this debate, it's, it's challenging to figure out. It, on one hand, we do want to protect our volunteer members who serve on these boards and commissions from frivolous lawsuits, but then on the other hand, we don't want to stifle um, stifle comments or or um, or stifle the public from coming forth with complaints. I guess my question, and, and listening to the commentary, it seems like the main issues for the bill are that the um, only the board member would be considered for reimbursement, and second, that that decision would be made by the council. My question is, is there a way so that the board uh, of um, ethics, ethical conduct, would be the body that would make the decision so that it wouldn't have to come to the council and could that um, offer be provided for the board member or and the community member, whoever wins the case, but that the board of ethical conduct would make that decision, not the council. And I'm not sure who that question would go to, <laughs> maybe legal. Director Darby. I, I, I would like to um, ask the director of law that question. Um, it seems like that could be a path, but that's not in either one of these amendments or in the original bill. In that case, um, I would entertain a motion to defer this until we can get more information about how many ethical cases have been brought as well as if it's an opportunity to shift the decision to the Board of Ethical Conduct. We have a motion in a second for a, a one meeting deferral. And on the deferral, Council Member Mendez. Thanks, I, and I'm going to be in favor of the deferral, but um, since that idea came up from Councilmember Gamble, um, I was actually trying not to unnecessarily complicate things, but I would encourage um, our council director to think about the following. Um, in addition to everything else I said before, this would be the most bizarre fee shifting ordinance ever because instead of a finder of fact making a decision about the reasonableness of the fees, it would be a political body making a decision about the reasonableness of fees. As the director knows and the chair knows, um, very, very often when somebody seeks fees in a dispute, they ask for X amount and the finder of fact, usually the judge, will often award 85%, 90%, 30%, depending on what the finder of fact considers to be reasonable. And um, if, and, and there's no conceivable way the council could ever do that, obviously. Um, if it was gonna be shifted to the finder of fact, the board doing it, the legislation in addition to um, sending it to them to decide should indicate that they get to the determine the reasonableness of the fee request. Thanks. Thank you, council member. We have a motion and a second for a one meeting deferral. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? You move to defer. BL. 2022-1474, Roten Benedict Gamble approves a contract between Metro and Granicus LLC to provide service maintenance and licensing related, licensing related to various platforms, including but not limited to Granica government meetings, short-term rentals, monitoring, communication cloud and web streaming services for Metro-wide internal and external uses. Moved, properly seconded. 
I see no hands raised. All in favor? Any opposed? You approve. Bill 2022 1475, Henderson, Pulley, Withers, and others approves an agreement between Metro Government and the LAZ Parking Georgia LLC relating to the operation and management of the on street metered parking program with the public rights of way of the metropolitan area and approves a lease agreement to lease Metro property to LAZ Parking Georgia LLC to use as office space in performing these functions. Um, can I get a motion? Motion properly seconded. We have an amendment submitted by Council Member Henderson. Council Member Henderson, would you like to explain your amendment, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a housekeeping amendment. Uh, it addresses uh, a motion that was made by the Traffic and Parking Commission uh, upon uh, acceptance or approval of this uh, ordinance. It's some clarifying language um, regarding the issuance of a citation um, that was brought to our attention um, by the circuit uh, court clerk um, at the time of, of the vote at Traffic and Parking Commission. So it was just incorporated um, in the, uh, the motion um, to, to pass it there at the commission. Um, and then as well at that time, uh, also as part of that motion, uh, the uh, lease agreement, um, which is uh, just for the amount of $1 <laughs> to be um, some space uh, at the public works offices, that had not yet been executed. Um, and so that, um, that legal document is complete uh, and attached now to the ordinance. Um, so it is addressing those two matters, Chair. Thank you, Council Member Henderson. Does anybody have any questions of the sponsor of the amendment? Seeing none, all in favor of the amendment? Aye. Any opposed? We are on the bill. Do we have any questions on the bill? Um, Council Member Johnson, I saw your hand first. So, we'll, Council Member Johnson, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, it would be helpful for me and I think probably the viewing public for someone to sort of bullet point um, out what the terms of this lease are and specifically the financial benefits to the city. And if someone could also add in what our annual revenue is from our parking meters now and how that's gonna change. Um, this was obviously a pretty big discussion three years ago and um, we're sort of <laughs> getting back to it now. Um, so that would be helpful if, I don't, and I don't care who does it. Council Member Henderson, would you want to do this or you want council to do this? Um, Chair, if I could, uh, Director Alarcon is here um, and so I'd like to recognize her um, as well, colleagues. I, I believe for tomorrow um, we will have, and we can get into it here today as appropriate, of course, and will, um, but we'll have an information uh, sheet uh, for the body um, to uh, touch on some of those. Um, but. I would, if we may, defer to Director Alarcon. Director Alarcon, you are recognized. Thank you very much, good evening. Uh, this is a five-year term agreement. Um, it is set up uh, where we will be receiving all the revenue collected. Um, instead, originally in the past, I believe, the funds were going directly to the third-party vendor. That is not the case. The dollars will be coming all into Metro. We will be providing them with an advancement uh, for 90 days that will allow them to actually um, start up the business that we need them to do. It's acting as a management agreement, so we're re giving them a management fee, but every bit of other funds comes into our account, so we get all the dollars. Um, it, uh, they will be purchasing the equipment for us. We have already gone through and have evaluated the equipment, um, and then we will be adding a citation um, uh, management equipment to help us with the citation writing, because right now we do everything on paper. Um, the, one of the, as far as the revenue collected, uh, also this does require a $2 million guarantee um, of funds coming to us. Last year we collected roughly around $760,000 worth of revenue. The year prior to that we were less due to COVID, but the year before that we were roughly almost at a million point two. So uh, we were around 700 in 2021. Last year we were at 760 and the year prior to COVID we were at 1.2 million. Millions, and we are getting a $2 million guarantee in revenue to come in. Councilmember Johnson. How much is the revenue, the advanced? 
be for manage, management? It's uh, We have, uh, per the proposal, it's roughly 157,000 per month, so around 471, but that's still yet to be determined because we have to do a 30-day business plan that does not begin until the contract is signed. And that's that management fee of whatever it's going to be, a hundred and so thousand dollars, is going to be throughout the term of the five-year lease. So the management fee is actually stru structured a different way. The first year they'll actually receive sixty thousand um, dollars over the year of the course of the year. That will be paid over twelve months, though. The next year it bumps up to seventy-five thousand. The next year it bumps up to ninety. The next year it's a hundred and five, and year five it's a hundred and twenty. I do also want to share there is an additional opportunity for them to generate additional management fee of 30K. That'll be the same every year. Um, and that's based on additional performance indicators that they have to meet. And that's laid out in the, one of the schedules. I think it's schedule 13 it's laid out in. Okay, I wish we had all, we're gonna have this tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Um, you might wanna stay there for just one second. Okay. Council Member Mendez. <laughs> Did, did I just hear there's a special meeting about this? No, 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 tomorrow. Oh, oh, oh. Um, all right, thank God, <laughs> enough special meetings. Um, so just being uh, real direct, and this is a question over to Council Member Henderson, if it's okay with the chair. Um, sure. Just like, so my, I've got, Got a lot of bandwidth um, to take to pay attention to stuff. It doesn't include this, so I've paid no attention to it hardly at all. I do know that several years ago when we started down this road, Council Member Henderson and I were thinking a lot of the same things. And so honestly, the fact that I've seen her name on it so far has made me feel like, oh, pay attention to other stuff, Bob, and not this. So I'm asking, because this is a nice public meeting and I don't, I'm not supposed to do it elsewhere. Is she, is she telling me this is a, a, a great deal? <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot like that. Council Member Henderson, he is putting you on the spot whether this is a great deal or not. Can you, can you verify this is a great deal? So Chair, um, I refrain from using super superlative adjectives like that. <laughs> um, I think this is a good deal, a solid deal. It's had a fair amount of scrutiny on the Traffic and Parking Commission side. You all have kindly elected me to represent you on the Traffic and Parking Commission. Um, to your point, um, Councilman Mendez, this has been sort of in the public eye and Council's view for a long time in a variety of forms and under um, a great deal of uh, uh, scrutiny. Um, the, I think the, the, the major change at this juncture is that this is a management agreement um, that also includes uh, the, um, the equipment um, for uh, a, a smart parking program. Um, so we're many years behind our peer cities. I think we've all gone to other cities where you pull up, there's a kiosk on the block, um, you can incorporate your phone and so forth. So um, this would be uh, effectuating that. Um, the uh, contracting um, is very uh, detailed. Um, I do appreciate uh, that Director Alarcon, um I shared with her, uh, whether it be uh, Chair Pulley or um, um, Councilman Parker or some other colleagues that have been very engaged about on-street parking and how do we maintain that. Um, she has kindly met with uh, all of them individually to um, uh, kind of hear their concerns uh, and questions. And I have seen in the redrafting uh, of the contract over time, um, council member uh, kind of questions and concerns uh, incorporated. So I think there has been a real uh, good faith effort to incorporate uh, just questions and concerns of the council. Um, obviously at the transition when Ms. Alarcon came uh, in January, so not yet here a year, um, she kind of re-engaged this process. Um, and so I've appreciated the updates. Um, I think you're right. Um, we, uh, we have a um, document here um, or the department does uh, that will uh, outline um, some additional uh, details for the body, but I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions at this time because it is in the fiscal space and budget and finance. So I feel that it's um, a good uh, contract. So. She did not say great, she said good. Well, so I, uh, Council I, Member Mendez, would you like to respond to that? I just uh, say thank you for helping us think through it. Thank you. Uh, 
Council Member Hurt, I will come right back to you, but Council Member Swara was hand was up quite a while ago. Council Member Swara. <laughs> Thank you, Chair, um, and I appreciate the two comments before me. Um, what I would like the information tomorrow to stress, uh, in addition to the total revenue, is when I was adding the numbers together, um, it looks as if we're saying we will collect at least $4.6 million. Uh, we have an operating expenses we, which we are responsible for, estimated at 157,000 a month. Metro has to pay all of that. And we also have the management fees, which we are responsible for. And then we're saying that we will make two million on top of that, guaranteed. And so without seeing the business plan, because I did ask for a copy of that business plan, that business plan typically is what tells me that this is the projected cash and projected expenses, but we don't have that. And so I'm interested in knowing how we came up with the two million, especially now that we just heard that we we had less in the last uh, two years. And so um, in, in, in getting that information tomorrow, I think it would be great to see what the projected income is supposed to be and if it's actually, um, sustains or, or, or covers all of this. And then the other question that I have is in terms of the guaranteed payments, um, if they do not make two million, does that mean that the company will make it up and give it to us? I mean, that's, is that a legal thing, Tom? Director, uh, can you answer both of those or do you want to get one tomorrow and this one I, right now or? Yes, I can answer both of them and I will provide that as far as how the assumptions are, but the two million guarantee was for that. Uh, their original proposal estimate was roughly around $1.8 $1 million. So the two million guaranteed revenue would make sure that our expenses are covered. And if they do not hit the number, they still have to pay us the two million no matter. So we will not be out of pocket. The 4.8 million is based on where we feel there are uh, growth opportunities in the parking program by using the new smart parking technology. For example, making the kiosks available, giving the opportunities paid by app, or to be able to do it through a QR code, which we see a lot of our private sector companies actually using text messaging. So moving to a much easier practice of how they're going to pay, I think we feel we'll have better compliance than what we have right now with people throwing quarters in the machine. So that has a lot to do with it. There is some additional things that get us that does get us to the 4.8 million so I want to be very transparent and that is looking at upping the hours of operation right now our meter shut off at four, four, five o'clock so we are going to be taking back to a business as part of the business plan as an analysis of what it would look like to extend the business hours to something more reasonable because it's really silly that we turn off at five because our entertainment district doesn't turn off at five but we also um, um, want to look at adding some more opportunities of where people are parking, but there's currently not a designated as a parking meter space. So there's a lot of opportunities that we can do through that that is be part of this, the 30-day plan that gets us to that 4.8 million. The other part of the 4.8 million is just on the citation side of enforcement. We have not done the best job in the past of, of uh, citing folks when they are illegally parking, exceeding the overtime, and especially in our neighborhoods where they have residential parking we have not done a good job in that area so part of this plan is actually adding additional staff to help us with that enforcement side of the house so there's a lot of different uh, things coming to with the plan that's going to allow us to meet that 4.8 I'm pretty comfortable with that but nevertheless they have to pay us two million to cover our expenses so we won't be upside down so we were very deliberate in that so, thank you. So in, in, in doing the, the, the business plan, uh, the 4.8 is projected for the first year knowing that there might be things that needs to happen, the things that need to take place, but subsequently it should be more than 4.8. Yes, ma'am. We anticipate that every year, over every year, of, we would be able to increase that revenue based on adding additional opportunities to um, to the program. So, more inventory to come online, extending additional operation hours, even potentially a rate adjustment. Our dollars, the amount we charge per meter, is actually much lower than our than our peer cities, um, as uh, Councilmember Henderson had mentioned. So, it would be looking at bringing that all together. We do not want to come out full barrel because <laughs> we 
give a, sh a true shock to the community and we do not want to do that. We feel like there's some opportunity just in the hours of infor the hours of operation as well as some inventory that's just kind of sitting out there that's ready for us to properly sign and enforce and we have not done a great job. So there's a lot of great opportunities for this program to, uh, to build over. We anticipate um, and estimated that the, by the year of the end of year five of this, we should be in the $15 million range. Uh, and the last question that I will ask and I'll uh, pass it over is that when I look at the analysis, it says that the business plan will not be submitted until 30 days after. And so if someone look at that and also review the assumptions behind the projection and decided that this is a good assumption and it's uh, measurable and it's deliverable and we can achieve those. Uh, yes, ma'am. They provided us with a proposal when, I'm sorry, council member, did you want to take that? Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just jump into this stuff sometimes, so sorry about that. Um, they did provide us with a five-year proposal. We did look at those numbers to make sure they were realistic assumptions and they were pretty much on online. Some of the savings that we'll actually be able to apply that's not built in yet to their to the assumption is the lease, for example. They had in their business proposal, when they in their proposal to us, an actual leasing of space somewhere else in the city that was pretty expensive. And I'm like, oh, we have a, no, no, we'll, we'll, we'll give you a place for a dollar so that that money is saving to us because whatever they spend we actually reimburse so whatever dollars we can save that's more money that stays in our pocket so we're being very um, responsible in that way so even though they have a plan that's roughly around 157 157 thousand dollars a month I do expect that to be different when the business plan comes forward just because we've been working on some things already to get it to a lower price so that we have more dollars coming into our into Metro's pockets and I said last one, but this is the last one. <laughs> so it did say that um, for months where they were not able to collect enough to meet the expenses, Metro will reimburse them. So will the refund every month go into an account and then their, their payments will be coming from there? Or at what point do we get the two million? Is it monthly or is it something we get at the end of the year? So if we have to at the end of the year, we will round up to make sure that the city is Metro Nashville is whole. So there is a monthly reimbursement. So they'll have to provide us with the regular um, profit and loss statement showing how much revenue we collected, how much we had an expense Expenses, what is the loss taking off our two million but still at the end of the year if we're still not whole they have to any up it and keep us whole so that we're not out of pocket any expenses you're welcome thank you thank you council member Swar. council member hurt you wanted to speak a while ago are you still wanting to speak yes thank you mr chair i was just wondering if um handicapped parking had been factored into this will they still be able to utilize our parking meters for free is there going to be publicized with that and how would that necessarily affect i guess the bottom line in terms of um paying or uh, and, and if the handicapped parking will everyone take over, you know, the handicapped park and take over the parking, the limited spaces. So thank you for that question, Councilmember Hurt. Um, so currently right now by state legislation, handicap uh, folks with an appropriate handicap placard are allowed to park at a meter space based on the hours of enforcement time. So for example, if you can only park in that space for four hours, you're only eligible for four hours of parking. Um, I will tell you in the past, we had done, done a great job with that either. People were parking on the side, on, the, on street parking all day at no cost. And basically we started enforcing that about two months ago. We did that by notifying everybody. We did a soft warnings where we gave notice that, hey, you are only allowed to be parked here for two hours. You cannot park here all day. And then eventually those folks actually found appropriate parking are no longer using it. So yes, ma'am, we did factor in the ability of handicapped spaces for handicapped individuals to use their placards, but it will be based on the actual hours allowed for parking. So you can't, they can't do four hours here and then jump to the other side of the street. It's four hours period and they're done. Council Member Hurd, anything further? No, Council Member Johnston, Council Member Verter, I saw you, I'll get you. Thank you. Um, my question is about the uh, equipment that is being installed just thinking worst case scenario, if this agreement does not 
um, last th for the five years or at the end of the five year period, who owns the equipment and uh, is it proprietary to this particular company or w will another company be able to jump in and, and pick up where they left off or could we um, foreseeably take over those, <laughs> those functions or? So thank you for that question. No, it is not proprietary. This is Sorry. Sorry. No, no, no. Um, that we we can purchase. So it is something we can easily take over. Um, every single bit of the equi equipment that we purchased is equipment that can easily be moved over into our system if that's the direction we want to go. But we own it? We own it. We don't have to buy it from them. I do not. We okay, will perfect. Thank you, Councilmember Johnson. Councilmember Vercher. Thank you, Chair. Enforcement, that was my question. Do you want to answer some enforcement questions? Yes, so uh, we currently have five employees that we actually have enforcement in the field today, and obviously that's not enough for a city of this size. We are, uh, through the contract, we'll be adding eight additional enforcement officers to the street that will be helping us with the enforcement. Um, and we are also looking at doing some cross training with our enforcement team that, that help us with um, Transportation and License Commission as well so that there's cross training training to help in the evenings and the weekends and stuff like that. So we are anticipating that our enforcement will be improving dramatically. It's something I heard very clearly from many of the council members that it's not happening. So we did build that into this overall plan. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Council Member Vercher. Sorry. I got you. One more question, Chair. Yes, um, but, uh, uh, Was this put out for bid? Okay, um, how many minorities? So um, if I could address that, uh, there were actually two um, companies that bid and they do have minority partners. Let me specify, uh, uh, black companies. Um, I will have to get that back to you, I'm sorry. Thank you so much, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Anyone else with any questions? Councilmember Henderson, we have a motion properly seconded on your amendment. Any other questions on the amendment? All in favor? Any opposed? We are on the bill. All, I'm, we already moved and said, well, we have approved the amendment, so we're on the bill. All in favor? Any opposed? You approve uh, that is everything for our committee tonight does anybody have anything i see no hands so we are adjourned been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit Nashville.gov.